America, the land of ideas and the first great awakening, awakening and the enlightenment. So we need to do a little more world history review and talk about the Age of Reason, which was also known as the Enlightenment. And this started in Europe with a scientific revolution. People came out of the Dark Ages and into the Renaissance with a sense of curiosity about the natural world, particularly, and really started to apply logic and reason to that natural world. Men like Newton and Bacon and Galileo we're really looking for logical answers to scientific natural questions. Um, you know, how does the Earth move around the universe? Does it revolve around the sun? Um, is the sun the center of the solar system, etc.? And as the century wear on, the 16th moves into the 17th, moves into the 18th century these sort of logical ideas begin to be applied to also political thought and religious thought, not just natural science. So it's being applied to economics, religion, and politics as well. And it really had its center in France in the 1700s. So there are some favorite and famous um, Enlightenment thinkers that absolutely had a big impact on American history, the first being John Locke, and he was a British gentleman, and he wrote um, in his second treatise uh, that natural laws were what governed men, and he asserted that the people had the right to change their government if the government was unjust, and that all people under these natural laws had what he called natural rights, and that was the right to life, liberty, and property. Religion, which most distinguish us, should most distinguish us from beasts and ought to most particularly elevate us as rational creatures above brutes, is wherein men often appear most irrational and more senseless than beasts. So there's actually a sort of secularization of thought at this time as well, and people are moving away from religion or at least separating their religious lives from their political lives and their economic lives. Another Enlightenment thinker that you see at this time is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was a Frenchman. He believed that society should be ruled by the general will of the people. Um, he was also influenced by Baron de Montesquieu, another Frenchman, who said that power shouldn't be concentrated in the hands of any one individual, such an, as an absolute monarch, but should be separated and shared and checked. Um, and so these ideas were printed in pamphlets and publicized widely throughout Europe, um, but then also made their way to the colonies. You also had American intellectuals in the 1700s in the British colonies who were reading these ideas and often visiting the old world. Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin spent ex considerable time in Europe, primarily in France, and religious leaders were also seeing the benefits of science, such as Cotton Mather, who encouraged vaccination against smallpox. Rather than seeing smallpox as something to be feared or a curse of the devil, it was like, there's some science that'll prevent you from getting this. Not that you shouldn't pray, he thought, but you should also maybe get a vaccine. So these gentlemen, primarily Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, later become part of the men who are known as our founding fathers. You also have a shift in American religion to what is known in Christianity as deism, which is a religion of nature. It was looking for God, with a capital G, in the natural world. And it was looking for a rational theology in and among free-thinking Europeans of the 8th, 17th and 18th century. These folks insisted that religious truth should be subject to human reason rather than divine revelation, and um, it should be confined to a small number of educated and generally wealthy elites. Um, colonial deism was largely a private affair, and it was often below the radar. It wasn't something they talked publicly about very often because it was fairly controversial, as you'll see when we get to the Great Awakening, which was kind of the opposite of deism. The biggest deists in the United States were um, Benjamin Franklin as well as Thomas Jefferson. At the same time you have this enlightenment sort of using reason among intellectuals to to make sense of the natural world and the behaviors of man, you also had 
a religious revival occurring in the colonies called the Great Awakening. And not all ministers were swept up in these age of reason, uh, like Cotton Mather. In fact, some of them swung the other way. And you had preachers such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield who roamed the countryside and visited towns and had very evangelical, conservative, religious sermons, which attracted huge crowds they would they would usually come into town and set up tent revivals out on the outskirts of a town and the entire community would be part of these festivities that could often last days um, and the sermons would be hours long Jonathan Edwards um, wrote the most famous of his sermons which then was published in a pamphlet and was widely circulated throughout the colonies called sinners in the hands of an angry god and he believed that new englanders particularly were too concerned with worldly matters and the accumulation of wealth and he believed that um, there was this idea of predestination uh, that came out of the john calvinist teachings during the reformation and he had given a lot of fiery speeches with a lot of powerful imagery a lot of the fire and brimstone you're gonna burn in hell forever kind of style of speaking uh, this is actually one of his um, pulpits that was portable you can see it would collapse and fold and he would just take this around the countryside and he would set up these revivals and he would stand on this and give his speeches so we're going to kind of consider what would account for the tremendous appeal of evangelical Christianity to men and women living on both sides of the Atlantic during the latter half of the 18th century. Well, first of all, there was some turmoil in the 18th century. It's an era of extraordinary upheaval and crisis on both sides of the Atlantic. It is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution has its start in England and then very quickly comes to the colonies, particularly the northern colonies, and it starts in the textile industry with mills um, and in moving looms into large factories and, and making fabrics in a mass production sort of way. This creates class divisions and inequality. Um, you have Methodists on both sides of the Atlantic that attract a lot of miners and iron workers and Methodists are kind of a new sort of spin on Christianity that come out of this time period. You also have a lot of war and fam famine. Ireland's going through the Irish potato famine. Germany's pretty much been at war constantly during this century. France is at war with the British. The British are at war with the Spanish, had been at war with the Spanish. So it's just constant struggle in Europe. And the colonies, here in the colonies on this side, you had families on the frontier. Now the frontier at this point is like western Pennsylvania. It's not very far west. Who are also struggling to survive, trying to cohabitate with Indians, um, and often not successfully in that regard. And they're battling each other. So here you have folks the potato famine, huge exodus, um, Native Americans attacking uh, American forts on the frontier, and in step these preachers that are essentially appealing to the fears that people have about life at this time. The other thing that's going on is you have people who are starting to seek comfort in community events and seeking fellowship with one another. When you are on a rural frontier the only time you see other people is when you come together for church and so church becomes a very social event Presbyterians Baptists and Methodists touted that their churches were havens from evil afflicting ordinary people and they were idolins of stability and Christian charity and so it was an attractive place to socialize they were highly publicized and you can kind of see um, these ideas they they played on a lot of imagery of heaven and hell and the devil and angels sitting on your shoulder and excess and gluttony and the sins all of those things so when we look at this political cartoon um what does it make you think of and it's a political cartoon from the time what do you notice and we will look at this in class as well but we're gonna to start to look at this in a context of what was going on in 
the 18th century colonies. So the significance of the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening. One, the Enlightenment exposed Americans to democratic ideas, which ultimately inspired colonists to declare independence from Great Britain. And it's really interesting that John Locke has, and Mousseau, Rousseau and Montesquieu have all of these ideas that are then espoused by the founding fathers. But we had an interesting discussion about slavery as well and how slavery and slaves were counter to this movement. Slaves were not seen as humans and were dehumanized often and, and ultimately were not given the rights that people were touting um, as part of these Enlightenment ideals. The Great Awakening, you had a lot of new faiths emerge, and that also had a democratic spin on it. Um, you, If you didn't like the church you were part of, you go and, and it was kind of an American thing to do, go and start your own new church. The Reformation really democratized um, religion, and so people could go and be part of a different church and, and follow their hearts and their ideas. Common men could become preachers. It wasn't just the educated elite or the priest class. And there was a national movement, and it, the first of its kind, the Great Awakening did not really happen in Britain at all. So we're going to start to dig into some of these ideas in class, and so it's important that you know all of this stuff as we do some document analysis with these ideas in class. All right, Groovy, have a great night. Bye.